Good morning, I'm Kayla Burton. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Abigail Fridman. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about over the next hour. The Syracuse Student Association has put forth an initiative to lower the price of textbooks. Plus, one student organization continues its work helping students with disabilities see how they're making a difference across campus. And a Newhouse professor and a recovering heroin addict discuss opioid addiction with the help of a novel. All that plus your weather and orange buzz coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this hour with registering for classes each semester comes buying new textbooks and materials. And as we all know, those costs can start to add up. And now the Student Association is working with the university to help ease the problem in the years to come. Our Tamar Turner joins us live from the Shine Student Center with the story. Thanks, guys. So I'm actually downstairs right now in the Student Activities Office, where the Student Association is one of many organizations that's housed here. And I actually found out from them, well, according to collegecalc.org, the average student at Syracuse spends nearly $1,500 on books and supplies yearly. And so it's no wonder that students have been voicing their concerns about the expenses. But the Student Association may have a solution. So for materials, for a class, the most I've had to pay it was probably around between $400 and $500 for one class. This can be an overwhelming amount, but how does the Student Association plan to fix things? We've been trying to work with the administration and different stakeholders and players at the university to see what we can do to make um, professors, faculty, and other students like be able to work together to bring down some prices of textbooks. In addition to this, they are looking at other models on campus and how they are appealing to students. Currently, Whitman, um, the School of Management and Business, they employ this tactic where they have an online textbook forum where students can go, Whitman students can go in and select specific chapters for their classes and just purchase an access to that and that be it. It is the Student Association's hope that this initiative will not only make things easier for faculty, staff, and administrators, but students as well, because just one textbook can cost an upward of $200. I was ecstatic to hear that they were working on this initiative because it's something I've been thinking about for a really long time, like why are we not able to have more affordable textbooks? But making textbooks more affordable isn't something that will happen overnight. It will take time, but at the end of the day, um, after a couple semesters maybe, after a couple more meetings, we're going to be able to see this issue from all sides of it and the administration, the faculty, the staff, and the students and the student organizations are all going to be on the same page. And for the students? It is about more than just money and books. People have actually been listening to what we've been saying and that there's people out here who'll go out and fight for us and make sure that we're able to have the best college experience without having to worry about the financial side of it. And so with recent events like the Ackerman assault and actually the SU men's Duke men's basketball game against Duke, the Student Association has had to place this issue on the back burner, but Members of the organization tell me that they are optimistic about what is to come and are hoping to provide a solution for students in semesters to come. Reporting live from Mornings on the Hill, I'm Tamar Turner. Time to check your weather for today. Olivia Proya is live outside on University Ave, braving the cold to tell us what, what's, what we can expect. Well, Abby and Kayla, I can tell you one thing for sure. It is pretty darn cold outside and it's not going to get much better throughout the week. Right now as I'm standing outside, it's about 11 degrees, but with windshield, it feels like about one. So if you haven't headed out the door yet, I would bundle up because it's only going to increase to about 15 degrees over the next few hours. And as that temperature slowly rises throughout the day, so does our chance of snow. Of course, what would you expect? Around noon today, we should start to see some flurries, which will get much heavier as the day goes on. But by early evening, we should be feeling a little bit warmer at about 16 degrees. And by then, it should be snowing somewhat hard. So be careful on your morning commute home because there's gonna be some slick road conditions. It might get a little icy. Later tonight, it's gonna be the warmest part of the day. 19 degrees, ladies and gentlemen, so it's gonna be hot. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. Snow should let up around nine o'clock, so it'll get a little bit easier to drive. It'll be easier to bear outside, but that snow will continue from tonight into tomorrow. Um, so 
going on throughout the day, it's just going to get a little bit worse outside. It'll warm up, but it's not going to be something that you could feel that, that much. Other than that, it'll be pretty brisk conditions, a lot of snow, and catch me back out here shortly to find out what'll be coming next week. Back to you live in the studio. Thanks, Olivia. The State of Democracy Lecture Series is hosting another event this Friday. It is Women in American Politics, 100 Years After Suffrage, and some pretty prominent female figures will be speaking. Former Onondaga County Executive Joni Mahoney, State Assemblywoman Pamela Hunter, and Rogers University Political Science Professor Susan Carroll will all be in attendance. We're seeing multiple women running for president in the 2020 cycle. And what we're trying to do is trying to give people a sense of the historic nature of these candidacies and also what are the particular opportunities and challenges that women candidates face when they run for office in the U.S. The event will be held in the Maxwell Auditorium this Friday at 4 p.m. Anyone can attend. Tickets are not needed. Faculty and Staff Appreciation Week is happening on the SU campus. Several events are happening with the theme of thanking university employees for their service. Earlier in the week, discounted tickets to the women's basketball game were distributed to a few lucky staff members. From 2 to 5 p.m. today, there will be a licensed massage therapist in the Shine Student Center, along with desserts and coffee. For more information on the events offered, head over to news.syr.edu. A Newhouse newspaper and online journalism professor is also a novelist. Cheryl Reed's debut novel, Poison Girls, follows a fictional reporter but draws from a real-world events. Our Gilat Malamed is live in the studio with more. Thanks, guys. Over the weekend, Professor Reed did a reading of her book at a local library. Her thriller novel that discusses young girls who use opioids was met with a discussion on the reality of addiction. Many reporters would have walked away and not before delivering a stern warning. But how else could I get the truth about why girls were trying heroin and dying for it? Newhouse professor and author Cheryl Reed is reading from her novel Poison Girls, a book about a reporter who follows suburban teen girls doing heroin during an epidemic. After covering young girls doing drugs as a reporter years earlier, the fiction novel was not completely far off from Reed's own experience. This was happening with, um, with girls in Chicago with, with um, poison, which is, poison is the street name for fentanyl-laced heroin. And um, I saw the similarities and I, I said, you know, this is just the same story over and over again. Reed's book excerpts were weaved in with personal anecdotes from Jordan Eubanks, an advocate at Helio Health Center. He's been in recovery for six years and described his struggles with heroin addiction even while working on a presidential campaign. Nobody knew my secret was that I was addicted to heroin. And I, and I was shooting it up and I was sneaking needles past secret service agents when they were coming to town <laughs> oh to like... <laughs> Fiction. Someone had given Narcan to the ghost girl, but it wasn't enough to revive her. Met fact with a Narcan training. On their back, you lean their head back just slightly so and put it into the nose and depress. The life-saving drug can take someone out of a heroin overdose. Nurse Paula Mallard says she decided to come to the talk to try and get into the mindset of what to some may seem unthinkable. I do like to learn what drives people and um, it might help me in my practice when I'm with people just to say the right thing or to understand. The Chicago Writers Association named Poison Girls its 2018 Fiction Book of the Year. Professor Reed's book is available on Amazon and at Barnes & Noble. Reporting live in the studio, I'm Gilat Malamed for Mornings on the Hill. Thanks, Gilat. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, a senator from the Graduate Student Organization joins us in the studio to explain how Syracuse Orange After Dark events don't equal opportunities to graduate students and undergrads. Also coming up, one illustration student is turning her drawings into a clothing line. Find out how she's making a name for herself right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Mornings on the Hill. One SU student is taking her talent from the studio to the fashion world. Dylan Mayones is a senior studying illustration who has started her own clothing line. It began when her friends asked if they could wear her art, so Mayones learned how to put her designs on sweatshirts and hats. She says she never realized how this could help her career. Like my artwork is almost me, so when you say you like it, that means you like me. It's just support and you have to like realize that that's just how I'm making a brand and making myself who I am as an artist and who I am today. Myona says her clothes have helped her name spread in the design world. You can get your own items on DylanMyonez.com. One Syracuse football 
excuse me, football player had a special moment this year. Along with going to the Camping World Bowl, this Syracuse football player also got to go to another bowl. Ever since the age of eight, Ifatu Melanfanu has dreamt about playing in the NFL. He spent his mornings and nights playing the game he loves and was inspired by his older brother, Obi. This year, Obi, who plays for the New England Patriots, went to the Super Bowl, taking his brother along with him. A local coffee shop recognizes Eating Disorder Awareness Month. This coffee shop not only serves its coffee and food, but dishes out even more. Ophelia's Place, located in Liverpool, is recognizing this year's this month's eating disorder awareness. The shop is not only covered by numerous encouraging signs, but it is also providing programs that allow anyone who either has experience in eating disorder or knows someone who has to reach out and to be given the support they need. On Thursday nights from 6 to 7.30, Ophelia's will continue to hold group meetings and it is open to the public. Good morning, I'm Ashton Hiron and this is your Orange Buzz report about what's trending here on social media. Last week, Syracuse men's basketball head coach Jim Beheim was involved in an accident that took the life of 51-year-old Jorge Jimenez. As the investigation continues, students are talking about it on social media and last night, the Onondaga County District Attorney William Fitzpatrick said that Jim Beheim was travelling within the speed limit or close to it at the time. Now, Syracuse men's basketball is our topic of discussion. It seems to be what everyone is talking about here on campus. Um, last night they were in Chapel Hill and they lost to North Carolina 93 to 85. People are crediting the loss to the Oranges. Poor performance on the free throw line. Um, here we can see O'Shea Brissett at the free throw line it makes me more depressed than climate change. People are kind of brutal with their comments as they're not the ones on the free throw line. When will Syracuse make a free throw? The world may never know. Also, as well with continuing with the basketball thread, eyes are on... Um, eyes are on Howard Washington, the sophomore who decided to take a red shirt. He also announced that he suffered a stroke last year when he, and that's why he was taking a red shirt in December. He suffered the stroke on campus. People are reaching out with support via Twitter. One that I liked was, I hope the team plays their hearts out tonight for Washington, for Howard Washington. That was regarding the game last night. Also here from Jill Abbott, she says, we're blessed that Howard Washington chose us. May his character and strength inspire others to be better people. And we're thankful for the students who were there to help him. Really showing their orange support here on Twitter. I'm Ashton Hiron, here for Mornings on the Hill. One SU student organization wants to help graduate students have greater access to student activities on campus. Our Kylan Watson is live in the studio this morning with a student that is the senator for the grad student organization. Thanks guys. I'm joined this morning by Obi Rama, a free aid vet. Bye. How are you? Hey, I can't, can't complain. Thank you. So Obi, tell me a little bit about, uh, about Orange After Dark and what you guys want to do with that. So all year we've been working on trying to make grad students more included into the local, just the local Orange community. A lot mm -hmm. of times when we think about segregation, instantly everyone thinks about race. But segregation can be on the most micro levels too, and that includes class level, you know? Uh, because undergrads like dramatically outweigh the number of graduate students, all focus for those initiatives like Orange After Dark, or when there's issues on campus, they all go to the undergraduate focus. However, grad students feel a lot of those same concerns, those same isolations, especially if you consider the fact that graduate students don't have a unified orientation platform. So for international students, they don't like, and for students who are coming here, they don't fully understand where to go for two different leisurely activities that undergraduates might have more access to. So Orange After Dark would be a great way to incorporate them into that local community and show them that Syracuse is more than just a school. And so what would that look like? What are you guys trying to plan around Orange After Dark? So uh, as of now, it's just begun discussion. Um, we've tried to focus on not being too reactionary and more about making sure it's a long-term success. So we had Courtney Jones from Office of Student Activities come speak at GSO last week. She just laid out like what Orange After uh, Dark does. In its current state right now, OAD isn't 
doesn't an office, office of Student Activities where Orange After Dark is run out of doesn't have the capacity to hold graduate students just because that initiative is pretty much being run by Courtney Jones and Loretta. And they're doing a fantastic job. Office of Student Activities is an amazing, amazing entity on this campus. So the problem is also that GSO and grad students as of now do not pitch into um, Orange After Dark. It's all run by and paid for by undergraduate students, meaning that when there's events like the Black Panther premiere last year, it was a really popular event, but all the students who get first access are undergraduates. And if there's tickets left, then maybe graduate students can buy them. But OAD is very popular, so all of those activities usually sell out. So we're trying to just talk about ways where down the line, maybe graduate students can pitch in to help with that. But however, there's a lot of logistics that we have to go to. You know, you can't just give money and then hop on. You know, you have to figure out staffing needs for volunteers. Courtney Jones has a hard time trying to find volunteers for Orange After Dark events. So if anyone's interested in volunteering, definitely reach out to Office of Student Activities. But just working to see how we can like fix those problems is the first step before we start anything. We need to make sure that we're covering all of our bases. Right. And so what would that look like if you, you guys covering or doing Orange After Dark like events? In a perfect world, it would be awesome. You know, we would have pretty much the same, we'd pretty much be copying the same format between, from GSO and SA. Um, in, in my personal opinion, it'd be nice to have a unified platform. That way, I think it would encourage more graduate students to want to get involved within the life within campus, but also, it would also encourage more undergraduate students, I feel like, to get to, see, to seek out grad school as an option at SU. Syracuse has one of the lowest matriculation rates for um, undergraduate students who stay here for grad school out of private universities. I think a lot of that is that there's just a lot of isolation. You know, you don't know what it's like to be a grad student. You don't have any interaction with your t uh, grad students other than the TAs uh, in your class and the people at Kubal. So in a perfect world, what we would like to see is that it would be modeled after the Orange After Dark event that they have now. All right, well, thanks again, Obi. Uh, thanks, thanks once again to Obi Rama for joining us this morning. I'm Colin Watson, live in the studio. Back to you guys. All right, still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, one Syracuse organization is working to create an environment for students with disabilities. Stay with us. Mornings on the Hill will be back in two minutes. here awesome. on campus that guides members of the disabled orange community through their college experiences. Our Landon Wexler joins us live in the studio with the story. Thank you so much guys. Well when SU students think of their campus, diversity is often one of the things that come to mind. But it isn't too often though that they take notice of the disabled community. Meet Olivia. She's a freshman from Carthage, New York who wants an education has a boyfriend, and wants to graduate from college. Her favorite parts of college thus far? I like going to events and restaurants and games, like basketball and football games. Olivia has disabilities, which made her dreams of college slightly complex. Syracuse University's Inclusive U strives to provide opportunities to students just like Olivia to have their college experience. But disabilities range among individuals. So we asked the director of Inclusive U, Bud Buckout, what does it take to become an Inclusive U student? We model our application after the application that SU puts out. Um, then we tried to look at some of the different components too. So you have University College, they have their own application process. So some of the schools are a little bit different. So we tried to do the same general questions they may ask and then we throw in a couple more just to get a little more information. But with disabilities, a lot of the time comes the need for support. All the students bring their own support people to help them in class. Um, we don't hire or provide the mentors for that. We call them a campus mentor. Along with there being the need for classroom and personal support, opportunities like these would require the university's support. And according to Inclusive U Communications Manager Carly Gavassi, SU has been doing just that. The campus has been very welcoming. So, it, you know, two years ago we uh, started having students, uh, giving them the, the ability to live in a residence hall and they have internships all across campus, so we get help from departments to provide internship sites. As we've heard, Inclusive View has tons of programs to help students with disabilities feel at home on campus. But for anyone, integrating can be a little bit tough. So how do some of the students feel the program has helped them? Jared Conn-Bagley is a student mentor for Inclusive U, 
and he says students here have opportunities like nowhere else. Our students are in seminars. They are actually integrated in college courses. They are going to all the Orange After Dark events, all the student events. Grafasi says that, that in just three years, Inclusive U has grown from 25 students to over 75. So we can expect to see the program grow even more going forward. Reporting live in studio, I'm Landon Wexler for Mornings on the Hill. That will do it for us this morning. I'm Kayla Burton. And I'm Abigail Fridman. Don't go away. Mornings on the Hill continues right after this break with Michelle Houston and Fernando Garcia Francesca. See <laughs> Tough word to pronounce, huh? <laughs> it's great last It week. happens. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Michelle Houston. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Fernando Garcia Franceschini. Here's a look at some of the stories we'll be talking about in our second half hour. SU Students is visiting Puerto Rico to help out during spring break. And a Newhouse alum makes her way back to the school to inspire current students. And see how Syracuse drama students are helping the community in an unusual way. All that plus your weather and orange sports coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Our top story this half hour, some SU students will spend their spring break helping others. Hendricks Chapel is organizing a service trip to Puerto Rico and Ooh. our Daniel Booth joins us live this morning to tell us more. Uh, Puerto Rico has been dealing with an unbelievable tragedy and the road to recovery hasn't been easy. Hurricane Maria forced families out of their homes, the entire island lost power, and too many people lost their lives. The people of Hendricks Chapel are going back to Puerto Rico for the second year in a row in hopes of aiding the recovery process. There are pockets and places that still need continued relief, still need food, still need support, still need medical attention. In the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, Chaplain Bartholomew of Hendricks Chapel organized a service trip to Puerto Rico as part of the Christian Outreach and Send Relief programs to help those in need. Relief is something that has to happen immediately after disaster, but we know that relief has to lead eventually to recovery, to development and advocacy. During spring break, Chaplain Bartholomew is bringing 12 students with him on his return trip. He plans to engage the Syracuse community as much as possible because the road to recovery for Puerto Rico is far from over. The relief, the need, the um, trips are going to need to be ongoing beyond the first year. Um, I just definitely felt like we're going to need to continue to invest in this. Last year, Pastor Bartholomew led the charge by bringing members of the Syracuse community down to Puerto Rico to help out after Hurricane Maria. But this time around, there's a different goal in mind. Going in and working directly with um, small communities and, and families actually to rebuild or provide them with um, packages or food. The Hendricks Chapel community is planning another trip to Puerto Rico this May so more students and faculty can get involved. I think it's really important for students to get out there and do this work. That's um, one of the most important things you can ever do in college is get out of the classroom and have an experience like this. Hendricks Chapel has been involved in relief efforts of natural disasters for years. They've traveled to New Orleans to help out after Hurricane Katrina, South Carolina after Hurricane Michael, New York City after Hurricane Sandy, and more. If you want to get involved, go to, Hendri go to the Hendricks Chapel website for more information. Reporting live for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Daniel Booth. Thank you, Daniel. Time for another, time for another check on your weather for today. Olivia Proya is live on a, out on a very, very, very cold <laughs> University Avenue to tell us what to expect for the next few days. Olivia? Thanks, Fernando and Michelle. Well, within the last couple of minutes, I had to grab my scarf because it's actually so cold outside. I feel like Randy from A Christmas Story where I can't put my arms down because I'm so bundled up and I'm still cold. But that's actually going to change as we go through the week today. 
It's about 17 degrees outside, which will be finally feel around later this evening. It's about 11 degrees right now. And that temperature climbs up throughout the day and then we'll be seeing some snow. It should start just around noon and continue from then into the early hours of Thursday. Now on Thursday, don't be alarmed. There's gonna be a big bright ball peeking through the clouds and you know it's a rare phenomenon around here this time of year, but I promise you it is just the sun and it'll be sticking around for the next two days, even warming us up to a high of 38 degrees on Friday. And that's gonna be a hot one. But all that tropical weather will slip away into Saturday, unfortunately, when there's going to be about a 60% chance of a slight mix of snow and rain throughout the day. You might see some ice on the roads. And going into the start of the next week, we're right back to normal, snow and cold. Sunday, there's a small chance that we see some snow shower showers develop throughout the day. And by night, it's going to be pretty chilly with a low of about 6 degrees. So. Thursday and Friday are those two days that we're going to hope for. Thursday, it's not going to be super, super warm, but Friday, it's basically going to feel like spring. It's going to feel great. You might be able to get outside. There's a little 10% slight chance of rain, which we'll make up for on Saturday when that does come. It'll be with the temperature of the high right around 36 degrees. We might see some rain. We might see some snow. It'll be a mix. mix. It'll be pretty slushy out. I wouldn't expect the driving conditions to be good. And right back on Sunday, it's going to be pretty not so nice out, but I can't explain to you how excited I'm going to be for those two days when it's basically going to feel like spring. I'm sure you guys are too. But for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Olivia Proya. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Olivia. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm excited for it to warm up to 40 degrees. Oh, yeah. Same. <laughs> well, a new house alum made her way back to her alma mater this week. We're talking about Sarah Glover from the class of 1996 and current president of the National Association of Black Journalists. Glover came to the new house school as a guest of the Leaders in Communication series. She spoke about the importance of being second and right instead of first and wrong when sharing news on social media. She also talked about how crucial it is to bring more diversity into newsrooms. Glover gave students advice, advice about the importance of being persistent and determined. Everything isn't gonna just fall in your lap and happen. You gotta work really, really hard for it, and you've gotta be able to go around the doors that shut and the barriers that are placed in front of you and um, make a way out of no way sometimes. And it is worth all the effort it will turn out. Glover encouraged journalists to not editorialize and to stay away from giving their opinions when delivering the news on social media. Glover graduated from SU with a dual degree in photojournalism and African American studies. Well, SU students in VPA's fashion design program are participating in the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women campaign. Students are working with both the AHA and the Office of Community Engagement to put on a red dress affair. And it will be just that, with red paper dresses designed by first-year students and a display of 24 dresses made by juniors in the fashion program. The event will take place tonight from 5.30 to 7.30 at the Nancy Cantor Warehouse. All benefits from the event will go to the Heart Association's Go Red for Women campaign. The New York Civil Liberties Union says it is important for SU students to speak up about the I-81 project. The Graduate Science Policy Group recently held a discussion on the topic. Students, faculty, and Syracuse residents all shared their thoughts. Project Counselor Lanessa Chaplin says students can help make a difference. And we know that. And so creating a better community that's for everyone, for the entire region, is, is why we do this. And we're hoping that students will get more involved and start making some noise. Members of the New York Civil Liberties Union explain the different options for replacing the downtown portion of I-81, which include a street-level community grid or a tunnel. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, our reporter Sam Carter is going live from a contest at Life Sciences where you can add your thoughts on a new smoothie bar. Wow. Also coming up, the SU Art Galleries received a huge donation that will give students hands-on experience on their field of study. Those stories and more coming up on Mornings on the Hill. Don't go away. A new juice and smoothie bar is coming to the Arch Gym when it opens next year. But if you'd like to try some of the drinks that will be offered, or maybe suggest a concoction of your own, there is a tasting event this morning at the Life Sciences Building. Mornings on the Hill's Sam Carter is live to show us what it is all about. 
Good morning, Michelle and Fernando. I'm here at the Milton Atrium at the Life Sciences Complex here on the main campus of Syracuse University where, let me ask you guys a question. You ever wanted to name a building or anything like that, but you've never led Syracuse to a national title like Carmelo Anthony, and you don't have a Carnegie-sized bank account. Well, today might be your chance, sort of. There's a smoothie tasting event going on where you can choose what kind of smoothies might be in the new Arch Gymnasium when that opens next semester, but you can also try and name the building, which is cool. You get a sign up over here. This is one of the smoothies I got right here. It smells like a mango passion fruit concoction, which seems pretty good, so let's give it a shot. Yeah, that's solid. That's really, really tasty. That's good. So come on down to the Life Sciences Building. They're here till 11.30. Now, if you can't make it today and you want to pitch some recipes or pitch a name, that's fine. You can go to the Food Service Instagram account. That's SU Food Service. at SU Food Service. All right, so we're going to wrap it up from here. We're going to go back to you guys in just a second. One more sip of this thing. That's tasty. A. We got A right here. Back to you guys in the studio. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sam. That looks yummy, doesn't it? It did. It does. <laughs> a Syracuse University graduate who wants to remain anonymous has made a major donation to the SU Art Galleries. We are talking about 180 photographs that now call the Art Galleries home. These are pieces created by more than 75 artists, including Ensel Adams, Robert Frank, and Laura Gilpin. Students enrolled in the Collections Management course will have the opportunity to document and catalog the objects. Also, the galleries have selected a student curator to examine the collection for an ex exhibition that will open later this year in late August and run through early November. Ten Newhouse students are venturing to Texas for spring break. They will be attending the South by Southwest Conference, which is billed as the largest gathering of creative professionals in the world. South by Southwest hosts conferences and festivals that integrate music, gaming, comedy. Director of the Center for Digital Media Entrepreneurship, Sean Brannigan, is working with the students and will accompany them. He says each of them have a specific interest in innovation. So I take my students mostly because it allows them to see what will be the future they're going to work in. They come away as basically experts in five days. Students get the opportunity to learn about different startups and meet with innovators from far and wide. They've even got plans to meet with an executive at Google. South by Southwest runs from March 8th to 19th in Austin, Texas. Welcome back in, to Mornings on the Hill. I'm Danielle Bullock, and I'm joined here by art exhibition honoree, um, Spencer Stoltz. That's right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're, we were just talking about your art exhibition, your 17 collection art exhibition, which was beautiful, by the way. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and get into our, what, the questions I have for you today. Okay. okay. Um, so how did you know that your art would act, your art would act as your way of expression? Um, so I don't think I ever had a moment where it hit me. Um, I noticed that I always think in images and feel in images. Um, and I just noticed that um, it helps me think, creating helps me think. So it's something I've just always done as a byproduct to just thinking and learning. And what actually made you want to start painting and actually creating art? Yeah. Um, that's another thing where I never, I, one of my earliest memories was of me coloring and painting, yeah. um, and my mom is an artist. And so with that, I think it's just always been in me and it's always been a part of me. It's never been like a conscious decision um, to paint because I always did. Um, but I do remember vividly when I was studying abroad, um, I told my mom I was gonna drop out of undergrad and become a painter. <laughs> I feel it, yeah. I feel it. <laughs> and that didn't go well, she made me finish. Um, but I think when I studied abroad and was living in France, that's when I took my artistry more seriously. So did it give you some kind of relief? Like what does art mm -hmm. do for you? Yeah, um, so art is a form of expression. Um, some people communicate through words. Um, some people communicate through like showing better they can, than they can tell. Um, for me, it's my primary method of communicating. Um, I notice that it helps me process myself. Um, so a lot of times I'll be feeling something that I can't fully access until I kind of 
paint it out or sketch it out or do something Same. creative that, that comes out of me. Um, that's how I can really get me and yeah. get life. So. So yeah. you're, you might you must be a big fan of sipping paint. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I've actually I. taught a few. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, maybe you can teach me some yeah, later on. <laughs> <laughs> later. Um, so you named your exhibition mm -hmm. "A Time for Joy and a Time for Sorrow" yeah. after the third chapter of mm -hmm. Ecclesiastic in the Bible. Yeah. What made you actually want to name it, and what inspired you to name it? You know this title. Yeah. Um, so a lot of my work has it was I took a retrospective lens, so I was looking back on my past. Um, and I was looking at most of my most recent years, which have been spent here in Syracuse. Um, and I noticed that my time in Syracuse, there were a lot of really great moments. I've had so many opportunities that I couldn't have gotten anywhere else, um, like working with CFAC, working with the AAS department. Um, but there's also been a lot of lows here um, because of the weather and because of so many different university dynamics and politics. Um, and I noticed that my experiences here were either pretty awesome or absolutely terrible. Um, and so I used, I used that framing to conceptualize my um, work because that's how I conceptualize myself and my life and that's how I can um, kind of develop a framework for addressing my experiences was through, um, you know, in the chapter, it kind of delegates that there's a time for everything. There's a time to be right. happy, there's a time to cry, there's a time to reap, and there's a time to sow. And so I feel like that's something I've been learning here at Syracuse. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Spencer, mm -hmm. for joining us here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Danielle Bullock, and you can go see her art exhibit down at the Com Community Folk Art Center mm -hmm. between now and March 23rd. Yeah. For Daniel Bullock, I'm Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Faith Kane with your Orange Sports Update here on Mornings on the Hill. A season high in scoring for the Syracuse men's basketball team last night up in Chapel Hill. Orange met up with the North Carolina Tar Heels for their 16th meeting between the two franchises. The Orange looking for their fifth win against UNC. Starting out hot for the Orange, Frank Howard from all the way downtown to start the action. Then Tyus Battle drives down the lane with an alley-oop to Pascal Chuku. And Elijah Hughes now is like, I'm going to join in on the three-point party from the top of the key. Orange up 10-6. Then the boy who doesn't miss, Buddy Beheim, a foot off the line for the three. North Carolina could not stop the Syracuse offense, and the Orange led 46-43 at the half. But that did not, not last long, as the Tar Heels tied it up in the second half and never looked back. Early foul trouble for the Orange proved hard to come back from. The game stayed close, but Syracuse struggled at the three free throw line, only making 61%, while North Carolina made 34 of their 37 free throw attempts, the most of any team against the Orange since 2000. The Tar Heels defeat the Orange 93-85. Overall, Coach Jim Beheim happy with his team's efforts. We did the things uh, offensively uh, that would were We've, we've done on occasion, but I think we we're really uh, much better tonight than we've been, and I think it's something we can build on. But I think One player we haven't seen on the court is Howard Washington. Many believed he took a medical red shirt to recover from an ACL injury, but this is not the case. Washington revealed the reason from his absence is a stroke. Back in September, Howard Washington spoke on the incident and said, I'm blessed to be where I'm at today. The stroke was a scary thing to happen, but I am very fortunate in everything else that happened around me. He plans to compete next year. Some excitement on the lacrosse field this weekend as the women's team defeated a top five ranked team, the number four Northwestern Wildcats. And tonight you can get some more action as they face another ranked opponent. The woman defeated the number four Northwestern Wildcats in double overtime, scoring in the final 25 seconds to end regulation. The Orange never gave up in the final goal of the game from Emily Hoshuk in the second overtime to win it in the Orange 15-14. You can catch them facing off this afternoon for their annual pink out game at 4 p.m. in the Carrier Dome against the 13th ranked Loyola, Maryland. This is the 20th time this team will meet and Syracuse is looking for their 14th win. That's your sports update. I'm Faith Kane. Go Orange. Still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, we'll take you inside a program at the Syracuse VA that's building relationships between veterans and medical residents, but in a way you might not expect.
Welcome back. Syracuse drama students are working to bridge the gap between medical school residents and the patients they serve at the Syracuse Veterans Administration Medical Center. Our own Kendra Sheehan joins us now live with the story. Happy to be here. The ability for doctors to relate to their patients can be extremely important for making the right diagnosis. The Syracuse VA Medical Center is a teaching hospital, meaning medical school residents rotate through the hospital every few weeks. Because of these quick rotations, residents often don't have enough time to fully understand the needs of their military patients. How do we get medical school residents and military members to understand one another better? Associate professor in the College of Visual and Performing Arts, Stephen Cross, believes the answer is through the theater. What are the needs of uh, veterans or people still connected with the military? Um, what, are their, what are their medical, social, health re needs? And, and if we create a theater piece that that addresses that. Every second Thursday of the month, a group of SU drama students, including Claire St. Marie, head to the VA to put on a performance for the medical school residents. It's basically a show that bridges a gap between veterans and residents and shows them the similarities and differences between them and gives the residents a lot of resources about veterans and compares stories. Through research, Cross found that medical students and military personnel have a lot more in common than you would think. That residents are, are in many, as frontline personnel or first responders, there's, there's a strong relationship between the stress in their lives and the stress in the lives of military personnel. After their performances, St. Marie says the feedback from the residents is positive. They're so focused on what they're there to do that they don't always get the information that could really benefit them. So it's really nice to like come in and hear that they're actually learning something from what we're doing. Residents have been giving positive feedback on the performance, so SU drama students will continue to perform at the VA once a month to help bridge that gap between doctors and patients. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Kendra Sheehan. Good morning, I'm Ashton Harron and here's what's going on this weekend here on the Hill. Tomorrow Newhouse is hosting a symposium addressing issues that impact both Syracuse and South Africa. Do you have some fun facts that never get used? Well, now's your time to finally be the smart one in your friend group. Orange After Dark is hosting a trivia night in the Shine Student Centre at 10pm on Friday. Or maybe the semester is hitting you a little hard, the stress bus the event could help you out there. You can also catch the men's lacrosse team in the Dome on Saturday. They'll be squaring off against Virginia. That is at noon. There's not much happening on the hill this Sunday though, however, but if you're looking to get off campus, you could take a look around at the Central New York RV and camping show held at the New York Showground Fairgrounds. And that's weekends on the hill for this week. Have fun and stay warm, Orange Nation. I'm Ashton Hiron. Well, that is going to do it for us this Wednesday here on Mornings on the Hill. I'm Michelle Houston. Follow us on social media. And I'm Fernando Garcia Francescini. Thanks for watching, Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday live at 10 a.m. right here on OTN.